is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! <sighs> Greetings, Science Maximites. <clears throat> Welcome to Science Max. <clears throat> Experiments at large. My name is Phil. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be looking at water. But <clears throat> water is very heavy. But that's OK, because we need it to be heavy for this experiment to work. I don't know if I need that much of it, though. Maybe I can get, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, that's probably all I need. Today, we're going to be building a water-powered car. You'll need a base for your car, like this styrofoam, water bottles, shish kebab skewers, straws, scissors, elastics, paper plates, tape, a square of paper towel, modeling clay, vinegar, baking soda, water, and glue or a hot glue gun if you have an adult to help you, and... Uh, yeah, I know, this one is pretty involved. That's why you should go to the website for step-by-step -step instructions. Take your paper plates and glue two together to make a wheel. Then make three more. Wrap elastics around your base and then tape straws on the bottom. Trim them down, maybe about that much. Then take your shish kebab skewers and push it through a water bottle cap to make a hole. Then stick one wheel on, put the skewer through the straw, and do the same thing on the other three sides. Then take the water bottle cap and get an adult to help you make a perfect hole in it so that it fits your straw. Then use some modeling clay and hot glue to seal the straw and the cap so it's airtight. Attach the water bottle to the base of your car, then fill it with some water and vinegar. Next, you'll want to wrap up a spoonful of baking soda in the square of paper towel so you can make a little package. Finally, stick something underneath the underside of the bottle to raise the end up off the base. Bring your cap and then go outside. Ah, here we are outside. Yeah, I know, we're not really outside, but I have a science lab and you probably don't, so I highly recommend you do this outside. And don't forget your safety glasses. Now, this is why we make a little packet of baking soda, because we want to delay this reaction as long as we can. So I like to hold it there. We'll hold it there with one finger so I can get the cap ready, because we don't want it to react until we can get the cap on and then kink the straw to keep the pressure inside till we're ready to let it go. Then at the last second, you want to drop that packet in and quickly cap it and kink the straw. And woohoo! There you go, a water-powered car. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute, that's a vinegar and baking soda-powered car? Well, kind of. The vinegar and baking soda create a gas, and that gas creates pressure in the bottle, and that pressure forces the water out of the bottle. But it's the water leaving the bottle that creates the thrust. The water going that way pushes the car that way. Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So what we're gonna do is max out the water-powered car. Figure out how to get water going that way so we can go that way. But we means me and someone else. Who can help me? Oh, I know, Anthony from the Ontario Science Center. He'd be great at this. Hopefully he's not busy. We're gonna max out the water-powered car. <laughs> Anthony! Phil! Sorry about that. Did I scare you? Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, how you doing? Awesome, thanks. Great. I was wondering if I could get your help on an experiment. Yeah, okay. Which one? Uh, I'm building a water-powered car. It's gonna be great. It's Science Max Headquarters. I'll, I'll show you. Phil? Anthony. Phil? I'm here. What? Phil, where are we? Oh, this is the parking lot for Science Max Headquarters. Oh, so, okay. today, yeah. I want to max out the water car. This thing is awesome. Yeah, so what you do is you use vinegar and baking soda, yeah. and you pressurize this container, and, okay. and the water shoots out that way. So the car goes this way. Ah, Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, you know okay. your stuff. This okay. is why you're here. This is because I could really use your help and advice on how to make this bigger. OK, so we're going to need a bigger tank to pressurize. Uh, so this, what about something like this? 
So we need something that can hold pressure. Do you think this would work? I don't know if we'd want to. And we'd have to put like pressure fittings on the barrel, like like cut a hole yeah. and weld them on. I don't know if that's. Something tells me this wouldn't work. So okay, need, sure. Um... I got some other stuff over there maybe that we could uh... use. Oh, ah, ah, check this out. Yeah, I think this would work. This would work a lot better. Well, this is my stand-up wash tub base. Your what? Uh, so yeah. we'll, we'll reuse it. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm thinking yeah. now, though? Uh, I know yeah. this. The problem is, I think this is like an oil drum, right? It and, is. And it's, a, it's an oil tank from a house. And these things are not built for pressure. You can get water tanks that you pressurize. Ah, uh, like hot water heaters. Yeah, you can uh, pressurize. They're built for that stuff. You pressurize them in your basement, and then the water travels up to, to like, the top floor. shower that or makes... something like that. So we'll, all we need to do is get a pressurized water tank. OK. Put water in it, put pressure in it, and put it on wheels. Uh, <laughs> and then we <laughs> open the valve, and it goes, right? That sounds amazing. All right, yeah, let's get to it, man. OK. okay I got to... some water tanks over here in this corner of the parking lot. Seriously? Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Busta Bika, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. When you're a professional chef like me, you spend lots of time perfecting the perfect recipes. I know my way around a kitchen, and today I'd like to show you one... That's not the fridge. Oh. <laughs> today I'd like to show you one of my favorites. Quail truffle gazpacho cakes on a plate of ice. Oh. Beautiful. And here's how to make it. Take some quail, some truffle, and some gazpacho and put it into a cake. Delicious. And here's the interesting part. How to make the plate of ice. Ooh. How did I do it? Well, I tried many different methods, and none were very successful. <laughs> but now I let science do the work for me. So here's what I do. You see, I've got my large block of ice, and I've got a fishing line over the top, and on the bottom, I've got two heavy weights. Now we wait. The heavy weights put pressure on the fishing line. This pressure melts the ice where it's pressing down. As the ice melts, the fishing line moves through the block of ice and eventually cuts its way through. There we are. My hours of waiting have almost paid off. You see, I've got a perfect line through the ice, and I stopped it just before it finished. It's the pressure of the line on the ice that makes it work. The same thing happens when you use ice skates. You see, it's a very thin line, and your body weight presses down on the ice, melts it a bit, and that allows you to glide across the ice. It also allows me to just pop this off. There you are, you see? Perfect plate of ice to put my delicacy on. Let's just try that now. There we go. Um... So I've joined Anthony, and we're going to max out our water-powered car. Our small design works by creating gas, which creates pressure, which forces the water out of the bottle, creating thrust. Our new plan is to get a water tank, put it on wheels, and put water in it. Then we use an air compressor to pressurize the air inside. When we open the valve, the water is forced out this way, which causes our water car to go that way. Okay. Ha-ha! <laughs> so, water car, maxed out version. Aha, uh -huh, huge water yep. tank. And filled with lots of water and lots of, uh, lots of air. air. Yeah, pretty good, right? Whoa. <laughs> it's a lot of it. So, did it mess up, did it mess up my hair? Uh, no, you look fine, you look great. Okay, good. Now, the only thing left is we just gotta open uh, this valve here, right? Yeah. You wanna do the honors? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it, okay. Okay, here All we right. go. Three, two, one, go! We open the valve and our pressurized tank moves forward. The air pressure in the tank forces the water out with enough force to move the tank. This is awesome! That was awesome! That was a great run, yeah! That was amazing! So, pressurized water tank on wheels. Totally worked. Totally worked. Total success, yeah. Um, so, because this is Science Max, the only thing we can do now is make it bigger. Bigger, right? exactly, okay. yeah. So, uh, problem is, I don't think we're gonna find a tank bigger than this one. Yeah. Um, so, 
because then it would be too heavy, right? Exactly. Much way bigger. too heavy. Maybe, maybe what we can do is just get a lot more water, okay. and, then, and then we find a way to pressurize the water. Oh, so don't pressurize the whole tank, just just the stream of water that's going out As of the tank. As it comes out, exactly. Something kind of like a, like a fire hose. A fire hose, right. So, so we take a big container of water. Right. And we, I guess we would need a pump. Yeah, like a pump would be perfect. So then we, we suck the water out of the container, put it through the pump to pressurize it, shoot it out of a uh, fire hose. Uh-huh, and then our car goes flying. Goes flying. OK. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, all, all right. right, amazing. When water is going fast, it has a lot of force. This is a power washer. It's made for cleaning concrete and wooden decks, but it doesn't use soap and it doesn't use heat. It only uses the power of water. Let's try it out. The power washer creates a stream of water that is moving really fast. It has the force to clean concrete, strip the paint, or even the Science Max logo off wood, but how do I max out the power washer? What's the most ultimate use I can think of? Power washer pumpkin carving. The power of the pressure washer creates a stream of water strong enough to make short work of my pumpkin. Power washers may only shoot water, but they can be dangerous, so don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, science! The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic and you will be granted entry. Send in the next candidate. Oh, no, not Overwhelmo. Did someone say Overwhelmo? No, wait, no, next. No, not that. OK, OK, good, OK. Behold the design, Overwhelmo! Welcome back, Overwhelmo. If you can truly demonstrate magic, you may join the Wizard Academy. A glass of water! <laughs> no, no, wait, that is not the whole trick. Okay, hold on. Okay, and this, a waterproof playing card. I put the card on the glass and flip it upside down, and then I say the magic word. The magic word. And behold, magic! <laughs> Yes? Is that it? Yes. Well, it's not magic. It is defying gravity. Nope. The water would fall and the card would fall to the floor. It's not magic. This is magic. No, it's science. Horse feathers. Look, the reason the water doesn't come out is the air at the top of the glass keeps it held in by suction. More air would have to get into this glass to decrease the suction, and because the playing card is keeping a seal on the glass, the suction of the air is holding the weight of the water up. Boulder Dash! Uh, all right, look, let's do a little experiment then, shall we? Let's move the playing card just a little bit from the edge of the glass. You see those bubbles? Yes. That's bad news. <laughs> Science, not magic. Well, I will return, and then you will see your mind will be melted by by the. No, that's not my music. Hold, hold. Will you will rue the day when? That's not my new order. Overwhelmo shall return. Our maxed out water car worked pretty well. Now it's time for something even more maxed out. We start with a giant tank on wheels. We add a pump to pressurize the water and a fire hose to shoot it out the back. What's more, this version is big enough for me and Anthony to ride. Water car! It's amazing! This is 
the more super improved water car. This so. tank holds 1,000 liters, and right now it has 720 liters of water. We have pump. A pump. That's water right, pump. our water pump. So the idea is we take the water from this container out through your hose, really pressurized, going really fast that way. Our car goes really fast this way. All we got to do is just turn on the pump, and we're ready to go. So we fire up the pump, and the water stream comes out really strong. So strong, I can barely hold on to it. Here we go! But even so, there is a problem. Nothing happened. No, oh, nothing really. Well, something happened. We got wet, but it didn't really. Okay. It's too heavy. Too heavy. So you're on it, and I'm on it. That's a lot of weight. It's we don't this. ride it. That's something. Yeah. Uh, also, this is kind of going crazy. Yeah. Because if nobody's holding it, it's just going to flap around. So we'll have a brace here. Yeah. Shoots it that way. That's good. And then we'll need, I feel like we'll need something to kind of propel it. Maybe a better propulsion system. Kind of like uh, one of those steamboats. So we put a big paddle wheel here. Exactly. And we aim it, I guess we aim it like down. down at the, yeah, exactly. Like that. And then at the paddle wheel, and then the paddle wheel spins, and that propels the car. Exactly. Right? Right. OK. OK, we, well, we can do that. Let's do it. Sounds good, yeah. Together. You know what? I have a paddle wheel because I had a failed hydroelectric. This is called flyboarding. <laughs> Powerful jets of water are being shot out from this board at my feet. Whoa. The engine on the watercraft behind me creates the water pressure, which travels up the hose and through the jets. The force of the water is strong enough that I can use it to fly around. So what's the difference between this and a water car? Well, we don't have to take that much water with us because it starts in the lake and ends up in the lake. So the only water I have to carry is in the hose that goes up to the platform. <laughs> Flyboarding is lots of fun, but it takes some practice to get it right. Bouncing on jets of water isn't easy, but I got the hang of it. It's all due to Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Whoa. Whoa. Physics! Our maxed out water car didn't work so well. The main reason is that that much water is heavy. 720 kilograms. Yeah. So Anthony and I have a plan. Rather than rely on the force of the water going straight out the hose, we're going to put a water wheel on the back of the water car. A water wheel works by catching water in the segments of the wheel. The weight of the water on one side of the wheel causes it to start turning. But we're going to use the weight of the water and the pressure of the water. Hopefully, both combined will be enough force to turn the wheel, which will drive our water car forward. A little construction, and we have it ready to go. OK, so here's the latest version of the water car, water wheel. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there we, go. we try it out, but there's a problem. The trick with the water car is the water itself weighs a lot. Every liter is one kilogram. So our 720 liters we start with is way too heavy to get the car moving in the beginning. But as the water gets pumped out, there's a sweet spot where the weight is low enough the water car might move. But then there's only a little water left. So it's a balancing act. We fill it again and see if we can come up with a plan. OK, new and improved version, only half full. So the idea this time is because we're starting with it only half full, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Then it'll begin to go a little easier because it won't have as much weight as it had the last time we did it. And Phil, yeah? I can't even move this thing. What? I don't, I don't think, I think there's too much fuel. There's too much. Yeah, there's no way we can move this. There's no way this is going to be able to move Even awesome. half full, you Even can't half full, move I think we need less fuel. We're going to get down to like maybe like a quarter or something like that. The thing is, we ran it from the full tank last time, and it, and it never 
Okay. It so never moved at all. What if, what if we gave it like a, a push to kind of help it get over that little like that little bump of it? Ah. Oh, so shot. give it a, the 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 first push when it's a, still got a bunch of water in it. We give it a bit of a push, and then maybe it'll go in its exactly, own. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Water yeah. Itself? Absolutely. Let's okay. do it. We start the pump and wait for the amount of water to get to just the right spot. Then we give it a push while it's still kind of heavy to start it moving. Sure enough, that push makes all the difference. Yeah, working! The water car is light enough to roll, has some momentum to keep it going, and the force of the water coming out the pump is enough to keep it moving forward on its own. Still going! Oh. All right! Like a beauty. It worked out. It went all the way. That way. Yeah. Way to go. The water car, finally, a success. It was the push. It was the push. That's all we needed to get it going. A bit yeah. of a push to get it going and a lot less water. And uh -huh. there you go. It totally works. All right, you want to do it again? Absolutely. All right, yes. here we go. Okay. See you next time on Science Max Experiments at Large. So much so easier to push it without any water inside it. Hey, welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. I'm Phil McCordick, and, and hold on a second, I'm just gonna change. Okay, that's better. Now, uh, where were we? All right, let's go make a boat. So you know that some things float and some things sink, like rocks, or wood, or uh, full water bottles and empty water bottles, or uh, carrots, foam, waffles, screwdriver, playing cards, plasticine, tin foil, Potato! My watch! Hmm, wait. That wasn't that wasn't supposed to go in there. So how oh. Mm. So how do you make a boat? You make it out of something that floats, right? Well, most boats are actually made out of metal. Tin foil is metal and well it sinks. But if you fold tin foil into a boat shape, it floats. And boats don't only float themselves, but they can hold people and cargo. In fact, there's container ships crossing the ocean at this very moment that are holding thousands of tons of cargo, and they're all made of metal, which doesn't float, it sinks. So how do boats do it? Are they magic? No, of course not. Boats are science. And here, you can be science maximites. Get some tin foil and cut it into the same size pieces and fold a couple different shapes of boats and see which one can hold the most weight before sinking. And now it's time to max it out. But before we do, here's how you can fold your own tin foil boat in less than 15 seconds. First, take a square piece of tin foil, then fold it in half. Fold one corner down and the other corner down. Then open it up and ta-da, you're done. If you want instructions on how to fold a more complicated boat, go to our website. I have a feeling I'm gonna need a few extra lab coats for this experiment. Like I was saying, let's max out the tinfoil boat and find out a little bit more about why boats float. I thought I was gonna come in over there, but I, I came in on the water sled. I, I think I had the coordinates wrong. Anyway, this is Husnia, and she's from Let's Talk Science, which is all about science education, right? Yes. Just like us. So you're gonna help me max out the tinfoil boat. I think I dropped it in the water. Hold on. Whoa! Whoa. Ah. Oh, here. Where? There it is. Ah, ha, ha, the tin foil boat. The tin foil boat. Phil, this is a boat? Well, it looked a lot better before I came down the water slide, but that's the idea. And then we make it bigger. What do you think? Uh, I don't think it's going to work, Phil. Oh, well, why not? 
tin foil is very thin, uh -huh. and it might not hold the shape of the boat. Well, I still think we should use tin foil, though. Why? Well, because the small experiment was tin foil, and I bought all of this tin foil. Then let's do it. Tin foil? OK, high five. I will, um, I'll take the tin foil, and you take that, and um, I'm going to have to dry off at some point. Welcome to shipbuilding for pirates. I'm Swabby, and I've built some of the finest pirate ships for some of the finest pirates this side of the Caribbean. And I can teach you to do the same. But first, you need to know your basics. Mass and volume. Let's start with volume. <laughs> but not that kind of volume. Which of these two chests do you think has more volume? Right, this one here. Which of these two balloons do you think has more volume? Right, this one here. Volume is how much space something takes up. Which of these two chests has more volume? Hmm? That's right, they're the same. But which of these two chests has more mass? Which is heavier? Hmm, hard to tell, isn't it? But what if I told you that this one was empty and this one was full of treasure? Oh, ho, 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 ho. loonies. Now, which one has more mass? Hmm, that's right, this one. These two chests have the same volume, but this one has more mass. This chest has more volume than that one, but this one... My loonies! That chest does not have as much mass. Volume is how much space something takes up, and mass is how heavy something is. And when you look at them both together, you're looking at density. Join us next time on Shipbuilding for Pirates, and then we'll look at how volume, mass, and density work together to make something float. Oh, my precious, precious loonies. Are you all right, my pretties? They can't talk, so I'm not sure what they're saying. So, Husni and I get to work constructing a large tinfoil boat. Our first design is just sort of a square, folded together out of a very large sheet of tinfoil. Simple, but can I ride in it? <laughs> there we go. A giant tinfoil boat, just my size. I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, it's too thin. You, th you think it's too thin? I feel like yes. Well, what should we do? Do you want to test it? Let's test it. Yeah. OK, good idea. So here's, here's the most important question. Do you want to test it, or should I test it? No, 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 you test it. All right, here we go. Putting it in. First test, does it float on its own? Yeah! Floats on its own, no problem. If I just get in very carefully, then it will work fine. See, if, I, if I'm, if I'm oh. careful about oh. how oh. I get in, no, it's, oh. it's fine. See, if I just get in like that. Oh, my God. Bill, Bill, are you OK? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's sort of, it's sort of, no, that's just air. You know what went wrong? It wasn't boat shaped. I think if we make it look more like a canoe, because canoes float, if we make it look like a canoe, it'll work great. No, 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 Phil. We need some support. If we add a couple of structures in between, then we add support to it. I'll tell you what. Let's make a boat like I want to make and a boat like you want to make, and we'll see whose is the best. That's a good idea. OK, let's do that. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to Shipbuilding for Pirates. I'm Swabby, and now we know what volume means, what mass means, and that together it can tell you something's density. Now let's find out why things float. Let's... Let's say we're out to sea and my treasure chest gets swept overboard. Oh, no! But it's all right. It floats because it pushes enough water out of the way, displaces it to carry its mass. But... What if my treasure chest had more treasure in it? Well, we're giving it more mass, but not more volume. Too much mass and not enough volume, and it will sink. Oh, no! My loonies! You need more volume if you want to float more mass. And that is why things float. I'm Swabby, and thanks for joining me on Shipbuilding for Pirates. So, the first version of the tinfoil boat didn't work out too well. Like that. Oh, my... 
But my idea is to build a tinfoil boat more like a canoe to see if a different shape makes any difference. Tinfoil canoe! Very Canadian. Very Canadian. The canoe part, anyway. I don't know about the tinfoil part. So, Husni and I had a bit of a disagreement of why the last boat didn't work. I thought it was because it wasn't shaped enough like a boat. So this one looks like a canoe. What I thought is that it requires some structure. Structure so that it wouldn't fold together. That's right. And we'll see how it goes. All right. All right, here we go. Did it work? No. OK, your idea next. Did you know it's easier to float in salt water, like in the ocean, than it is in fresh water, like a lake or a pool? That's because not all liquids are created equal. They have different densities. This is fresh water, or it doesn't have anything in it. And this is sugar. If I was to put one scoop of sugar in this water and stir it around until it dissolves, now this liquid is more dense than before I put the sugar in. Here's an experiment you can do at home using liquid density. This glass just has regular water with yellow food coloring in it. This glass, green food coloring, and half a cup of sugar in it. This one has a full cup of sugar in it, and this one has two cups of sugar in it. Now, when you do this at home, you'll definitely want an adult to help you because you have to heat the water if you want to dissolve that much sugar in one glass of water. I'm going to put them all in one container. You can do this at home, and when you do, I suggest you use a very small container because you have to be very careful when you put the layers in. You can use a turkey baster or a straw. When you put your finger on top, the air pressure will hold the liquid in, and you can just drop it in. But these kind of take some time, so I'm going to use the syringe of science. I'm going to use the most dense liquid first because that's the one that's going to want to be on the bottom. I carefully put it on the bottom of the container. The next layer, be very careful. And you'll see that the red and the blue aren't mixing because they have different densities. The blue is heavier than the red. We'll add the green. And you can see, even when it drips into the red, it comes back up to the top because the green liquid isn't as dense as the red liquid. And the denser liquids push the lighter liquid up. And now we're going to add the yellow, which of course has no sugar in it at all. And there you go. All the layers stay separate. If you put it on a light, you can really see it. Liquid densities. Now, let's max it out. Ta-da! The longest length of liquid layers. 12 liquids all organized by density. Starting from the bottom, we have honey, corn syrup, chocolate syrup, maple syrup, dish soap, whole milk, water, dyed blue, vegetable oil, extra virgin olive oil, rubbing alcohol, baby oil, and lamp oil. Liquid density. I really, really want to mix it up, but it took me a long time to make this, so I'm not going to. Our first two attempts at a tinfoil boat haven't gone so well. Husnia's idea is to make a tinfoil boat and add some more structure. Because the tinfoil just wants to collapse when I get in it. So we start with a large piece of cardboard on the bottom. Then we wrap the tinfoil around it and shape it into a boat. After that, we add some supports across the top to stop it from folding in when we add my weight to it. This boat feels a lot stronger than the one I was just in. I told you. So how does all of this work? So we got some support using broomsticks mm -hmm. and then some cardboard paper. And then underneath, we have cardboard. cardboard. And so how will all of this help the boat not sink with me in right. it? Right. The broomsticks will prevent it from folding this way, yeah. and you won't sink. Good. The cardboard will prevent it from folding this way, and you won't sink again. Not sinking is my favorite thing to do in the tinfoil boat. All right, so let's try it. Let's do now, it. Are you going to get in this one? I'll tell you what, Phil. If you get in and you don't sink, I'll go after you. Deal. All right. All right, here we go. Huh? Huh? <laughs> it's sort of working. Oh, no. Oh, no, water's coming in. It's sort of working. It's 
thing I learned is that a very light tinfoil boat can be very heavy when it's full of water. I don't know if fixing it is in the cards. I think we, I think we're gonna have to build another boat. Mm -hmm. So what do you think we should do? Let's add more structure. More structure? Oh yeah. What if we add like a metal rod around the outside and maybe some more metal rods and ribs? And we wrap it all in tin foil, and you think it'll work? Let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. Uh, don't worry about it. I've got this. No, I, I'll get it. I'll get you it. Sure. Okay. Oh, oh, you. Oh, Who wants to do an experiment with diapers? Oh, oh, oh! No, no, I'm, I'm serious. You may have a little brother or sister at home, which means you probably know where you can find some diapers. But there are two things you need to remember. First, ask an adult if you can use the diapers for your experiment. And two, only use unused diapers. Okay? Okay. So, you take the diaper, and if you cut it, be very careful, maybe get an adult to help you, over some black construction paper, like I have here, and you shake the diaper over the construction paper, you'll see that there's a little powder that comes out. And this is the secret ingredient. This is super absorbent gel. What it does is it soaks up all the liquid, and diapers are full of them. And you carefully pour it into a plastic cup, like that. Now you can see I have already done it with a number of diapers. It's important to use a plastic cup because it's a little messy, although it's non-toxic, it's totally safe, but it's still easier to clean up by just throwing the cup away. Now, add some water, and what happens is this super absorbent gel absorbs the water and turns very quickly into a paste. Look at that. Now, let's max it out. Five kilograms of super absorbent gel, 500 liters of water, now, it is time to do science! <laughs> and I have my own stir stick. <laughs> yep, definitely coming along. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure if we're getting anything on this camera, but I want to make sure it's recording. Yep, it's recording. There we go. It is definitely turning solid. Well, there you go. The giant super absorbent gel experiment. Corey, Trevor. I need some help getting out. <laughs> How many outfits have I been through in this episode? How many outfits have I been through in this episode? Anybody have a towel? There you go. Thanks, buddy. That's that's great. <laughs> Husnia's idea of adding structure to the tinfoil boat was definitely right. We just needed to go further. So we did it again. This time, we made a much larger boat. We started with a sheet of cardboard, then wrapped the tinfoil around and added some metal supports taped to the cardboard across the boat this way to make ribs, as well as some other supporting pieces in the front and the back. Then another metal rod all the way around the top, and finally, supports across the middle. All right, feel how strong it is. I'm really excited about this version of the tin foil boat. What we did is we used thwarts, uh, big hard pieces of wood that we did last time, but this time we have ribs. Ribs, right, which are made of a cardboard, a metal rod attached to it, and... And shaped, and we did a whole bunch of them in the, go the whole length of the boat. And then we used all of this bendable metal, and we have one that runs all the way around the gunnels, 
and a whole bunch that run down the inside. And we even used bike fenders at the front and the back of the boat to give it super rigidity so that it hopefully won't go like all the other boats have done so far. Are you ready, Husnia? Let's do this. One, two, three, lift. All right, let me get over. It floats, but that doesn't tell us anything because they've all floated at this point. It's only when I, I get into it. Okay, here we go. All right. So you knew you would never get wet. See, I don't think that's fair. I think it's time that you, you that you got wet. You I think we should yeah, go. No, no, I think no, you and I no, should no, just no, get no. wet right now. <laughs> just need oh, someone help. Whoa. Whoa. You're still dry. Okay. That is so unfair. Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max experiments at large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna be looking at vibration. Vibration is when things go back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> All kinds of things vibrate, like pendulums. Pendulum. Wait, wait, and pendulum. Pendulums are designed to swing back and forth. Stop that. Also, metronomes. Me oh. <laughs> Metronomes are used by people when they're when they're practicing music to keep accurate time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, putting it back. And okay. We're gonna be building. Whoa! Okay. We're gonna be building. <laughs> <laughs> this little guy, this is a vibrobot, and he vibrates and he skitters around on the paper. And if we take the caps off the markers, he makes interesting patterns on the paper. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Let's build a vibrobot. Okay. Oh, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to take off the ski boots, huh? Oh. Whew. There we go, that's better. So today, like I said, we're gonna be making a vibrobot. And here are all the materials you need to make your own. Plastic cup, three markers, an electric motor, just make sure you ask an adult first, a battery, a plastic drink bottle cap, a toothpick, scissors, this kind of tape is called electrical tape, science tape, which is the same as invisible tape, but of course I use this tape only for science and some modeling clay. And these are two bendy straws that I've taped googly eyes to. These are not necessary. I just like them for decoration. Now remember, if I'm going too fast here, which I probably will be, you can get all of the steps on how to make your very own Vibrobot on our website. Okay, so here's how you get started. First, you're gonna make the feet for your Vibrobot. So I attach some science tape to the markers, and then I put the marker on the bottom of the cup. And then I do that again to the next marker, and then the third, balance it like that. There. Next thing you wanna do is take your plastic drink bottle cap and make a hole with a toothpick. You wanna make it off to the side, right about there, just like that. That's so when it turns, it will be off center. That's what's gonna give us our vibration. So once you've made that hole, take some modeling clay and stick it in the cap to give it some weight. When you've done that, stick it onto the shaft of your motor like this. See how it's off center there? Now we just need to attach it to the Vibrobot. I just put it right here on the top and I like to attach the battery to the back of the cup. And now finally, we're going to attach the eyes. We take some science tape and we put the straws over here. I am Vibrobot, I am here to vibrate. Take me to your leader. So then you attach your tape with the wire the top of the battery there, and then the other wire to the bottom of the battery. 
just like that, and let your Vibrobot make some art. <laughs> now, if the battery is new, your Vibrobot might be jumping up and down quite a bit. So you can do what I like to do and add some more weight, and then you make better lines with your Vibrobot. And your Vibrobot makes art. How long will he last? Probably till lunch. And there you go, Vibrobot art. Art made by a robot. How cool is that? So that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna meet Chris from Logics Academy, and he's gonna help me max out the Vibrobot. Plus, we're gonna learn a little bit more about vibration. Come on. Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, uh, oh hey, Phil. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Okay, here's your Science Max lab coat. Thank you. So you guys at Logics Academy, you also build a Vibrobot, right? That's right, we do. This is mine, and it works pretty well. That's awesome. So, I want to max this out. Cool. So I thought we would start with, instead of this motor, we would start with this motor. Wow. It used to be a round circle, but I cut it off so that it's off-center. Perfect. I've also got, this is our battery. Fantastic. That's as far as I've gotten so far. Well, it looks like we need a frame next. Right, something to be the cup. That's right. So we just need some sort of larger cup. Ooh, how about that metal shelf over there? Oh, this thing? Yeah. This is just something I keep my parts on. It's perfect. Really? Yep, the shelves will house everything that we need, and it looks like it'll be strong enough to hold everything together. Now, the Vibrobot had markers on the bottom of it. That's right. To make a little pattern. Should we try that with this? Because we're going bigger, what if we used paint and paintbrushes instead? Okay, sure. We could attach paintbrushes to the legs. Pass me one. All right, so now all we need to do is get some paint and some paper. That's right. And uh, we can fire it up. Okay, let's, let's move it over this way. Vibration and frequency. What's the difference? They're all connected. Ta-da! Now, we get, whoa. Wow. Vibration is things going back and forth. Back and forth. And back and forth. It's a cycle. Cycle, 25 bucks. Oh, yeah, it's the wrong kind of cycle. Never mind. Well, if that's vibration, then what's frequency? Well, frequency is a measure of how fast or slow how frequent those vibrations happen. Look at this bowling ball. It is swinging back and forth, but not very fast. You could say it has a low frequency. We measure all kinds of things by the frequency. This thing is terrifying. When you turn the dial on your radio, you're tuning in to different frequencies of radio waves. Hey, look at this punching balloon. It's going very fast. You could say it has a high frequency. <laughs> so, now you know. Vibration is something going back and forth, and frequency is how quickly it does it. Yeah. Ramona, the bowling ball keeps coming through everything. How do you turn it off? Okay, back to our main experiment. Chris and I are taking a Vibrobot and maxing it out. We have a large motor and a battery, and we're taping it all to some shelving. Just like our small Vibrobot, our motor needs something to make it unbalanced when it spins. That's what will cause the vibrations. It's just taped. I haven't attached it in any other way. Do you think that's okay? As an engineer, I have superior faith in duct tape. Okay, well, that, that's good to know. We're also adding an on-off switch and some paintbrushes on the bottoms of the legs so our maxed out Vibrobot can make art just like the small one. The final step, dipping the brushes in paint and setting it on a big piece of paper. We fire it up and it immediately shakes everything off the shelves. Oh! It, it totally spilled all the stuff on the shelves. The motor shakes the Vibrobot a lot, but there's a problem. All that shaking is starting to take its toll on the shelves. The wheels come off, the screws come out, and finally... It totally it shook itself apart. Destroyed itself. The shelving unit just completely falls apart when it's being shaken. Vibration is really hard on the structure of an object. We need something more sturdy, something that can, that can take weight. Steps, maybe? Yeah. OK, hold on. OK. Ha, 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, this looks much better. Okay, great. So we build the new Virobot out of this. So more paint brushes, bigger motor, more paint, more everything. More everything. All right, good. This is a pendulum. It's just a weight suspended on a line and anchored from above. Pretty simple. Pendulums were used for hundreds of years for all kinds of reasons, but most famously in clocks. Why were pendulums used in clocks? Well, here's why. Let's mark every time the pendulum hits the bottom of the swing right here. Okay, watch. All right, now here's the question. How fast will the beeps be if I swing it from much higher up? Let's find out. No matter how high the pendulum swings, it keeps the same frequency. That's why they were used in clocks, because it could swing for a long while, and even though it would lose energy, it would still keep perfect time. The frequency of a pendulum doesn't change, no matter how high it swings or how much weight is on the bottom. The frequency comes from how long the line is. Now this is a pendulum wave. Because each bowling ball has a line that's a different length, they have a slightly different frequency. They start out swinging together, but soon they start to make interesting patterns. Remember, each pendulum is keeping its own perfect time, even if it's slowing down. It's only the length of the line that gives each pendulum a different frequency. And now, we're gonna max it out with, with, um, well, I guess these are already bowling balls, so this is already pretty maxed out. I'm just gonna, just gonna leave that there. These are balloons. This is a laser, and these are awesome laser safety glasses. Now, lasers are made of light, and light has a frequency. In fact, each color of light has a different frequency. This is a red laser. Check it out. Yeah, cool. This is also a very powerful laser. Oh, I can pop the blue balloon with the red laser because the blue absorbed the red light from the laser and then it heated up and the balloon popped. But here's the cool thing. I cannot pop a red balloon with a red laser because the red balloon reflects the red light from the red laser and I can't pop it. If I wanted to pop a balloon with a red laser, I need to use a darker balloon, one that absorbs the red light, like <laughs> like a black balloon. <laughs> so there you go. Lasers, frequencies of light. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this red balloon because it's always nice to have a balloon. <laughs> Chris and I are maxing out the Vibrobot, but our last version shook itself apart. Now the plan is to start with something more solid and try again. We found some very solid steps and added an even bigger motor, an even bigger battery, and attached a half circle wheel to make the vibrations when the motor spins. We add some paint brushes and fire it up. Here we go. Come on. Go, Vibrobot. Hmm. Watch the move. Is it moving at all? Hmm. Hmm. So it's still not working. It's sort of getting caught in the paper and it's on the paintbrushes. And the, yeah, the paintbrushes seem to be absorbing too much vibration and then the paper's stopping it as well. So why don't we remove the paintbrushes? Yeah. And we might as well remove the paper if we don't have any more paintbrushes. Yes. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Okay. No paintbrushes, no paper. Okay. Now let's try it. Three, two, one, go! Yeah! Aha! It's moving. Not bad. The shaking is good, but I don't know if the shaking is enough. So what do we do? Well, we could add another battery. Another battery, which would give it more power? That's right. OK, let's try that. OK. OK, so it wasn't working before. No. Not enough power. And now we've got a second battery here. That's right. We've wired them up so that one power feeds into the other, so we've got twice as much juice as we do. So it's just a matter of clipping this onto there. That's right. But hold on. Yeah, safety glasses, because now we don't know what's going to happen anymore. Ready? Three, two, one. The extra battery makes a big difference. The new Vibrobot shakes around and only shakes itself apart a little. 
All right, Whoa. that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so all we needed was more power. That's right, I think it didn't have enough power to, to vibrate up and down, and that's why it wasn't moving every time it hit the ground. So I think if we're gonna use this much power, I think we need to build it again. Okay. Build it even stronger, and with a bigger motor. Yeah. And more power, and then maybe I ride it. <laughs> you think we can build that? Of course. Of course, okay, let's do it. You wanna see something cool? I can make this water levitate. Defy gravity using the power of science. You wanna see? Behold! <laughs> gravity defying water! I can even make the water go very slowly. Or I can make the water go back up into the hose. Or I can make the water completely stop. <laughs> you know what's interesting? The water does not seem to be stopped for me. You see stopped water because you are looking at it through a TV camera. See? Real life, TV camera. Real life, TV camera. You see, movie cameras and TV cameras take a whole bunch of still photos and then run them together really, really fast. 24 times a second for our TV cameras. I have created a device that drops water at 24 times a second. And what happens is everything lines up. So it looks like the water drops aren't moving. But watch this. I grab the hose and it's fine. But I let it go and the hose is vibrating back and forth at exactly the same time the camera shutter is going back and forth and everything looks like it stopped. The power of frequency has defied gravity. Okay, so not really. It's kind of a camera trick, but I prefer to call it science. Here's a fun way to play with things going back and forth. This is Euler's disc, and it's designed to spin like this. What's going on is friction and gravity are slowing that down and pulling it towards the Earth. Now, you don't need a fancy disc like this to do this at home. All you need is a pot lid. Check it out. When the pot lid spins, friction and gravity start to slow it down, which means each spin gets lower and lower and the frequency gets higher and higher. But the difference between a pot lid and Euler's disc is Euler's disc is made to go for as long as possible. The heavy puck has a slightly rounded edge and sits on a glass surface that is slightly concave, like a bowl. All of this is designed to make Euler's disc last a really long time, which is, which is quite a while. But eventually, friction and gravity pull the disc down, and finally, it stops. Pretty amazing, right? Well, wait till we max it out. This is Trevor, head of the Science Max build team. Hey. Thanks for setting this up, Trevor. So what is this? This is a giant side of a spool, big hydro spool. OK, so this is the largest disk that we could totally find. And we've got it all hooked up here. We lift it up, we spin it, and then you pull the thing, and it will drop down and, and spin like a coin, because it's the only way we can do that with something this heavy. Yeah. Ready? I'm ready. OK. Trevor and I hoist it up and get it suspended above the ground. Yeah. Then I start to wind it up. Ready? When it's going fast enough. And go, Trevor! Trevor pulls the release and... It turns out a 200 kilogram spinning disc works exactly the same. As it spins and rolls, gravity and friction work on it, and the frequency speeds up as it gets closer to the ground until it stops. Giant Oilers disc. Nicely done, Trevor. That was awesome. That was great. Let's do it again. All right. Our Vibrobot was working well, so that means it's time to make it way bigger. We started with a big metal table and added a huge motor, one 20 times as powerful as the last one. Instead of batteries giving us 12 volts of power, we're going to use a plug, which is 10 times more power. We've added an off-center wheel for vibration, bolted the motor to the frame, and added a protective cage all around to prevent anything from flying off. 
It even has a seat for me to ride. Okay. Okay. You ready? Ready. Here we go. We fire it up, and it's very shaky. That was really uncomfortable. <laughs> oh. It was like very bangy, even with the even with the seat. Yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna, can I, I'm gonna try standing on All it. All right. When I try standing on it, the Vibrobot lives up to its name. It vibrates all around the lab. Wow, my legs are numb to, to the knee. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Bye, robot! All right. Yeah, that worked really well. That was awesome. I can't, I really can't feel my feet right now. And it held together, which is impressive. That's right, the more power and the stronger structure paid off. Yeah, I, the only thing I regret is not getting a chance to, wait a minute, wait a minute, come with me. Okay, so I achieved my dream of riding the Vibrobot. You did. But we never got a chance to make art, so we've dipped a whole bunch of nuts and bolts and heavy things in paint. Yeah. And now we're gonna turn on the Vibrobot and see if we can make some art. <laughs> Let's see how it looks. Oh, wow. Ta-da! Vibrobot art. Vibrobot has been a huge success and we got some art to keep. High fives. Well done. Science Max, experiments at large. Who gets to keep the art? Uh, rock, paper, scissors. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, tie. One, two, three. Tie. One, two, three. One, two, three. Wow. One, two, three. Ah, oh, tie. One, two, three. Man. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna be making one of the easiest and one of the hardest experiments to do. Here's what we're gonna make. A hot air balloon. And it's pretty easy to make. That's why it's one of the easiest experiments. All you need is a plastic bag, but not any plastic bag. The kind of plastic bags you get at the grocery store to put your fruit in. That kind of plastic is very thin, very light, good for hot air balloons. And you just wanna put two paper clips on the bottom of the bag to hold the bottom down. Now here's the other thing you need. You need an adult and a hairdryer. Turn the hairdryer on, put the heat on the highest setting and the fan on the lowest setting. The air inside the bag is getting hotter, which means the molecules are moving faster and they're getting further apart, which means there's going to be less of them in the same space. Less molecules means less weight, and that means it's going to be lighter. The bigger the difference in temperature between the air inside the bag and the air outside the bag, the better it's going to work. So I recommend doing this outside, actually, on a cold day. When it's been long enough, turn the hairdryer off and it will float. Ha <laughs> ha, now it won't float very long because the air inside the bag will quickly return to its original temperature and it will no longer be any lighter than the air outside the bag. But it's definitely fun to fly for a while, while it lasts. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna max out the hot air balloon and make a giant hot air balloon. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, Phil, they already exist. Why don't you just get a giant hot air balloon, I mean, they're big and you, no, 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 there's no fun in that. I wanna make one I built myself. I don't think I'm gonna be able to fly in it, but it'll still be pretty cool, I bet. I just need someone to help me. Um, oh, I know, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. Hopefully she's not busy. Michaela, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I was wondering if I could get your help with an experiment. Do you have some time? Yeah, I'd love to help out. Awesome. Sure. Okay, let's go back to Science Max headquarters and I'll show you what we're gonna do. Okay, nice. so ready? Here we go. Okay. Oh, no, huh. still here. Still here. Why are we still here? Uh, That's weird. Okay, I know, I know, I know. No? Uh, Why is the I code think, not working? I think it's the Science Center code. Try the... Try oh, the code. it's the lab code. <laughs> right. Phil, are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. 
So, Michaela, I'm glad you're here because today I want to max this out. This is my hot air balloon. It was better before, I, I smushed it in my pocket, but what I did is I, I used a hair dryer yeah. and then I put it in and I heated the air and, and then it, it rises up. Ooh. So in order to max it out, pretty simple, I just get larger bags, right? And then I thought we could cut them and tape them together to make a much larger balloon. Good idea, but you know, if we're making a hot air balloon, we need to make sure our materials are really light. Uh, the duct tape seems a little heavy. Even this bag seems a little heavy to me. In terms of, oh, you In mean terms of the weight. kind of plastic it is? Yeah, Might be a little bit. Yeah, it seems really thick, this one. Well, uh, do you know for sure? I've never tried it before. All right, well, that's science. We should try it and see what happens. Let's try it. Okay, so I'll cut along the side of the bag. You see that? Carbon dioxide gas. Our bodies breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Did you see it? Oh, take another look. How about now? No, you didn't see it, right? Because carbon dioxide is invisible unless you freeze it. This is dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. And this is wet ice. It's not really called wet ice. It's frozen water. Now, you know what temperature water freezes at? Starts with a zero, ends with a, well, it's actually zero, zero degrees Celsius. And this freezes at negative 79 degrees Celsius. It's much colder. I have to hold onto it with a glove because if I held onto it with my bare hands, I get frostbite. So here's the experiment. If I pour some liquid water on the dry ice, will it freeze again? Let's find out. Because the dry ice is so much colder than the freezing point of the water, the water begins to freeze from the bottom up in room temperature air right before our eyes. Whoa, totally frozen. Cool. Cool. In order to build our hot air balloon, Michaela and I are taking clear garbage bags, cutting them along the seams so they end up as one thin sheet of plastic, and taping them all together with duct tape into a balloon. Okay, so that's nice. how many bags is that? It's like 12 bags. Well, so you think that's big enough? <laughs> I think so, it's pretty big. Okay, I think we can stop there. Okay, so where's the, where's the opening again? Uh, oh, I think I it's on you your side. I hope you didn't duct tape it, Chloe. Okay, no, we're good, we're good. So. So it's going to inflate like this. Wait a minute. Let's let's okay. Let's make sure it works. <laughs> is it working? Ah, uh, kind of. <laughs> I don't know if it's <laughs> inflating. <laughs> okay, good. So it does inflate. It does hold air. Yeah. Right. So should we try it? Yeah, let's try it. Okay. So we're going to use a hair dryer. <laughs> right. And now we wait. It's working. Kind right? of. Oh, yeah. Woohoo. Okay, it's almost inflated. All right. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, on the count of three, we'll throw it, okay? Okay. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> doesn't quite float, it's huh? It's still too heavy, Phil. I think, think? we've got a couple problems here. The duct tape is really heavy. Yep. Also, these bags themselves are really heavy. Okay, well, if we want to fix the duct tape uh, problem, uh, we could use lighter tape. Like, what if, haha, yeah. -ha, we use um, invisible tape, or as I like to call it, science tape. Science tape. Which would be lighter than duct tape. That's a good plan. But what do we do about the bags? Like, Have you ever seen those, you know, those dry cleaning bags? Oh, that wait, I've got work. one. I've got one here. Cool. Perfect. Aha! Yeah, perfect. Because, you know, when I get my lab coats, dry clean. So let me see here. Oh, yeah, this is much lighter. This is kind of the same material as the, as the grocery store fruit bags, right? I have a better feeling about this one. So lighter tape, lighter bag means a much lighter balloon. OK, well, let's try it. First, I should probably take my lab coat out. is water. Now, it's 
ice water. <laughs> science. OK, no, that's not the science part. Here's something you can do at home. Get some ice water and a way to time yourself and stick your hand in the ice water. It's a little hard to stick your hand in ice water for a long period of time because after a while, it starts to hurt. But don't worry, the pain that you're feeling isn't actually because you're damaging anything. It's just your body's way to tell you that you need to take your hand out of the cold water. Yeah, you usually can't do it for very long. But some animals, like seals and whales, they live in ice water all the time. They live in the Arctic, so how do they do it? One word, blubber. Blubber is a layer of fat that protects you from the cold, or protects a seal and a whale. We don't have blubber, but we are today going to have some blubber, because we're going to make a blubber glove. Blubber glove. I love saying that. Here's how we do it. First, we want blubber. OK, this isn't blubber. This is lard, which is actually animal fat. You can use lard. You can use margarine or butter or shortening, anything with a lot of fat in it. And remember, this is messy, so definitely get an adult to help you. So we've got our lard, and we need a bag. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a scoop full of lard, like this. And you're going to put it in the bag, like so. Mm-hmm. Like that. There we go. And then you're going to start smoothing out the blubber or the lard like this. Because what you want to do is have a nice, thin layer all the way around. See? Starting to work. Yeah. Then seal the bag and tape the edges. Huh? A square of blubber. Then do it again. Here, I have two bags of blubber, and I've taped all the way around the outside. So I have <laughs> a blubber glove. Check it out. So let's try it out. I stick the blubber glove in the ice water. It's completely working. It is not even cold. The blubber is completely protecting my hand from the ice water. I'm not even remotely cold at all. That is very fun. So, try it yourself. A blubber glove. Now, how do we max out a blubber glove? <laughs> Watch. <laughs> water. Ice water. I know for a fact that I wouldn't last more than 10 seconds in here without my blubber suit. I'm going to make an entire outfit of blubber. I've got them in large plastic bags, and I'm going to get completely suited up in blubber with the help of Trevor and Stephanie. OK, guys, suit me up. It's very heavy. <laughs> Let's just go like this. Oh, OK. Time to cut back on the cookies. All right, let's do it. All right. Lover suit, go! <laughs> I can't. OK. OK, here we go. And... OK, so far. Oh. <laughs> the legs are warm. And... Oh. Blubber suit! Ha ha ha! I am a seal! Actually, here I am in the, in the ice, and I don't feel too bad. Blubber suit works! Ah! Blubber suit's refreshing, actually. You can just sit back and chill out. Well, there you go. Blubber suit success. Seals and whales are able to stay in ice water for their whole lives because they have protective layers of blubber, just like I do. OK, so now all I have to do is get out. <laughs> blubber suit! Oh no! My blubber is leaking! Ah, I've sprung a leak! My blubber! Oh, my precious blubber! No! What a world! <laughs> oh, hey, how you doing? Ugh, shut the door, it's cold out there! Ugh. Cold enough for you, huh? Well, that's nothing. Let me tell you. You know what temperature water freezes at? Yeah, zero degrees Celsius. But even that is nothing. 
Let's say it's winter in Winnipeg. It could get down to minus 20, maybe even minus 40, but even that's nothing. Liquid nitrogen, minus 196 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. The vacuum of space, minus 271 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. So, what's the coldest temperature? What? What's the coldest temperature you can have? It's called absolute zero, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, all the little wiggling that particles do comes to a stop. Everything is frozen. No more movement, no more energy. Everything stops. It doesn't get any colder than that. Absolute zero is the ultimate nothing. Brr. Time to get your mittens on. Our first hot air balloon didn't float very well. It's huh? still so heavy, Phil. I think, think we got a couple problems here. So we're making a lighter version out of dry cleaning bags and science tape, both lighter materials than our last version. We also went for more of a square shape than our last version, which kind of looked like a sock. Once we were done assembling, we got the hair dryer and tried it again. Ooh, it's sort of working. Kinda. It's inflating. That's something. Yeah. It's a start. <laughs> it feels it feels warm, like the hair dryer is actually making a lot of warm air in there. Yeah. This is definitely working better than the last version, because it's so much lighter. Yeah. Wait a minute. Almost got it. Oh. Yeah, it's sort of working, right? Cool. Kind of. <laughs> okay. Ready? Turning off the hair dryer. Oh. Huh. It kind of collapses the moment we turn off the hair dryer. Not huh? what we expected, was it? Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, it sort of works. Oh. The thing is, our balloon is so big that we need to heat up all of the air that's in there. I don't know if this hair dryer is strong enough. I think you might be right. Um, mm. So we just need something else that pushes heat. Yeah, more um, heat. So like a, like a heater of some sort. Uh, you know, we've got some heaters up in this room, actually, and maybe I could just tear one out. We can use that. I like it. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. There. Got it. An industrial heater. And this is going to work just the same as our hair dryer. It's going to blow a lot of hot air up here, but this is way more effective than a hair dryer, right? Yeah, way more powerful. So uh, we put the balloon over here, hot air comes up, the balloon inflates and hopefully flies. Hopefully. All right, let's get the balloon. So we put the balloon on the heater and turned it on, but it doesn't seem like much is happening. That's because the heater pushes less air, but the air is much hotter, which means it took longer. Should we have brought a book? But soon it was inflating. Definitely a better result than the hair dryer. <laughs> okay, you ready? I think it's gonna work. It's gonna be awesome. All right. Yep. One, two, three, let go. Lift off. Yeah! It's like a giant jellyfish! That's <laughs> huge! Uh oh, uh oh, it's tilting, it's tilting! No! No! Down. <laughs> okay, so the so the balloon flies, which is great. Awesome. Um, the problem is it turns over in the air. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that. And if it turns upside down, then all the hot air comes out, and and it doesn't fly anymore. Oh. I was thinking next time if we if we make it bigger, what if we had a little weight at the bottom just to keep it stable? Oh yeah. Okay. I've I've seen balloons that have sort of an X, like a very light wood that goes across the opening at the bottom. Oh, cool. Maybe we could tie a piece of rope to that to keep it weighted. And if the bottom is heavier, then it won't flip over upside down, right? Love that idea. Uh, so we're gonna weight it at the bottom with yeah. a little X so that it doesn't flip over. And we're gonna make a bigger balloon. <laughs> we're gonna need more bags. Oh, right, back to the bag store. Bag store! Okay. <laughs> Wait for me! Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Strange. The spoon is no sharper than it was before. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker, and today we're cooking with coal. Today we're going to learn how to make a drink cool. Look at this bottle of lemonade. It's warm right now and not very refreshing. So, what's the best way to cool this down? We put it in ice, right? But did you know there's an even better recipe than ice? 
you can make ice colder. It's true. All you need to do is add salt. I've got a second bowl of ice and a second jug of lemonade, and I've got two digital thermometers. What I'm going to do is add salt to this bowl. What the salt does is starts to melt the ice, and that actually consumes heat. This is called an endothermic reaction, and it absorbs heat, which makes the ice colder. And as you can see, this bowl of ice still sitting at around zero degrees Celsius, but this bowl, minus eight and falling. Wow. So there you have it, making something even colder than ice would normally make it. That is a way to make a refreshing glass of lemonade. I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Oh. With our new heater and lighter materials, our hot air balloon was floating free. That is, until it tipped over. When that happens, all the hot air inside escapes. But Michaela and I have a solution. So we decided to build an even bigger hot air balloon and add a way to keep it upright. So the process aside from that is pretty much the same. We put the end over top of our industrial heater and I will plug it in. Get that hair dryer again for good measure. <laughs> it's working. It's inflating, but we gotta keep we gotta keep fluffing it up, otherwise it just sort of sags. But you can see the top of the balloon is is definitely working. It's a lot it's a lot bigger than the last one, though. Do you think we made it too big, Michaela? <laughs> it's really big. I think it's working. It's definitely working. Uh oh, pull your side. Oh, oh it's totally working. <laughs> I'm so surprised that this works so well. <laughs> so the stick is gonna keep it balanced so the bottom faces down, but Michaela's gonna tie a string to the stick so that when it goes up, we can keep it centered. Okay, this looks good. You wanna let it go? Yeah, are we ready? Okay. Okay, three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> yeah! So let's recap. The hotter air inside the balloon is less dense than the colder air on the outside. And because we were able to get the air hot enough and the balloon light enough, it floats. Science Max, experiments at large. Hot air balloon. Thank you, Michaela. Awesome. That was so cool. Wait a minute, who has the string? Oh no, oh, oh no, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> Greetings, Science Maximites. <laughs> I'm Phil McCordick. <laughs> I think I overdid it with the fog machine. Uh, this is Science Max, experiments at large. Can you even see me? Let's, let's go over here. Today we're talking about states of matter. Now there are three main states of matter. Solid, like this table. Liquid, like the water in this beaker. And gas. Yes, thank you. And we're also gonna be looking at the things that kinda go in between. Things that are sometimes solid, sometimes liquid. Like cornstarch mud, which is very easy to make. All you need is water and cornstarch, which you can get at the grocery store. Mix it up however much you want. Just remember, two parts cornstarch to one part water. Twice as much of this, then you have of that. Very easy, mix it up, and you get cornstarch mud, which sort of seems like a liquid unless you hit it. And then it becomes solid. But if I pour it, it's a liquid. Even if I hold it in my hand and I hit it really fast, it turns into a ball and it will stay in a ball as long as I keep hitting it or squeezing it. But soon as I stop, it turns into a liquid again. Now we're gonna max this out. We'll go through the portal and learn more about solids, liquids, and gases. Yeah, right. That's why I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training and, oh no, wait, that's the code for the fog machine. Wait, uh, stop, stop, it seems to be stuck. Oh, uh, never mind, never mind. Uh, I'll fix it later. Right. Hey, Judy, how are you? Hi, Phil, how are you? Good. Judy is going for her PhD in chemistry, right? Yes. Fantastic, because that means you can explain cornstarch mud to me. Now, is this a solid or is it a liquid? Well, it kind of has properties of both. It's called a non-Newtonian fluid, uh -huh. so that makes it a liquid. 
a liquid. Well, I mean, it pours like a liquid, but when you hit it, it's a solid. So why does it turn solid when you hit it? So when you're pouring it, the particles are still far apart, uh -huh. so they can't interact with each other, and so they stay a liquid. But when you're hitting it, you're jamming the particles together, and they line up to become a solid. Now, does it still work the same way if we have a lot more of it? Uh, it should. Great, because I've got this 20 kilogram bag of cornstarch, and I have 34 more of them. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, but I think you'll need a much bigger container. N much bigger container, great. Um, I got some wood over there. I want you to go, and I'll follow you. All right. I'll follow you. Uh, uh, uh. I got, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, thanks, Ramona. And give me one of them fizzy drinks. Not too fizzy, just sort of medium fizzy. Thanks a lot. Hello, do you have trouble knowing what is a solid, liquid, or gas? Are you confused by jello? I mean, which is it? Is it a solid or is it a liquid? Water is a liquid, but what about when it's ice? Well, you gotta know your states of matter. There are three main states of matter. Solid, liquid, and gas. And there are three rules that you need to figure out which one of them is which. Does it flow? Does it fit the shape of its container? And can you squeeze it? Rule number one, does it flow? Solid, liquid, gas. Here's a gas, does it flow? Do the particles pour over each other and cascade down? Yeah, yeah they do. Does a liquid flow? Yeah, yeah it does. Does a solid? Nope. Rule number two, what happens when you put it in a container? Does it take the shape of the container? Gases take the shape of the container. Liquids takes the shape of the container. Solids do not take the shape of their container. No! I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I get the whole pouring and taking the shape of the container, but come on. Liquids and gases, they do both of those things. Well, it all comes down to rule number three. Can you squeeze it? Now, solids, you, you, can't, you can't really squeeze them. Liquids, you can't really squeeze them. Gases, ha-ha, bam, you can squeeze them. You see, gases compress. Liquids and solids, they don't really compress very well. The other difference between gases and liquids is Gases will take the shape and the volume of the container they're put in. Liquids don't do that. So there you go. Solid, liquid, gas. And the rules. Does it flow? Does it take the shape of the container? And can you squeeze it? Now you know your states of matter. That'll be 650. Cash only. So what is cornstarch mud and how does it work? Well, cornstarch mud is a non-Newtonian fluid which means it behaves differently than you or Newton would expect. Here's cornstarch and here's water. Cornstarch is made up of large blocky molecules like this. Water is made up of much smaller, rounder molecules like this. When you put them together, it looks something like this. It all has to do with how the molecules slide past each other. When you put light pressure or slow pressure on the mud, the water molecules and cornstarch molecules have time to shift out of the way. But when you put a sudden pressure on it, the water molecules squirt out of the way, but the cornstarch molecules don't have enough time. So you get a section that's nearly all cornstarch, which acts as a solid. Cornstarch mud is a shear thickening fluid. Shear is talking about the force of things sliding around. In this case, the molecules. So when the shear force is strong, the fluid thickens. Shear thickening. So here's the plan. If Judy and I make enough cornstarch mud, could we run across it? Let's find out. Yeah, I think mine is just the right consistency. How's yours, Judy? I think I'm ready too. This is much harder than I thought. Yeah, it's really hard to get it mixed at the very beginning, but uh, yeah. mine is ready to go. Okay, here we go. Sounds First good. batch. You ready? Yep. Dump it in. Woo! Woo! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. hmm. I thought that would be more. I thought so too. It's really not filling this up very much, is it? No. Huh, that's a lot of cornstarch. This is, um, this is great, but I think we're gonna have to go a little faster than this. I think we need some sort of mixing device. 
Yeah, I mean, we don't have to do this by hand. We can get some sort of machine to help us. Yeah. Right on, high five. Oh. <coughs> uh, we shouldn't high five when we have this stuff on our hands. Nope. Yeah, good call. Mmm, this science is delicious. This is rock candy. It's basically crystallized sugar, and you make it by turning a solid into a liquid and then back to a solid again. Here's how you can make it at home. You need a container that you're not gonna need for a while, and some water, some sugar. You can use brown or white. I like to use brown. And an adult. Here's why you need an adult. You wanna dissolve three cups of sugar into every cup of water, and you can't do that unless you heat the water. So get an adult, a saucepan, and heat the water up, pour the sugar in, and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. Then pour it in your container and let it cool down. Then you'll need a shish kebab skewer, which is something you can get at the grocery store. Cut it down to the right size so it fits nicely into your container. And then dunk it in your sugar and get some crystals coated around the stick. These are seed crystals and they get the whole process started. And now you have to wait for these to dry, otherwise they'll just fall off the stick when you put it in the water. So I've got one here that has dried out. You'll also want something to keep it from falling in the top of the container, so I'm gonna use a clothespin. Put it in there and dunk it in the container like that. And now for the final step, if you want, you can add food coloring. I like to use red because it reminds me of science. And I'm gonna use the stick to actually stir that up a little bit. There we go. Now, the dissolved sugar crystals in the water will slowly grow on the crystals that are already attached to the stick, and it will eventually grow into a rock candy pop. But it takes about a week. No, I'm just kidding, I've already got one that's standing by. Here we go. This one has been growing for about seven days. And there you go, rock candy. Delicious science. Now, how could we make this any better? I mean, it's crystallized sugar. It doesn't get any more maxed out than that, does it? Yeah, it does, come on. This is a giant container of sugar water, and I've been brewing a massive rock candy uh, crystal in it for a while, but uh, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of getting a little bit too big to fit out the top of the container, so. Uh, um, you know what, I'm just gonna, Put that back in there and chalk that one up to science because, well, eating a rock candy crystal that big would definitely not be good for my teeth, so, yeah. So our big experiment is to take a whole lot of cornstarch and fill a trough to see if we can run on it. But mixing it by hand was going to take forever. So Judy and I got a drill with a mixing attachment on the end. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> All right, so Judy, I'm noticing a bit of a problem here. What is it? Well, if I mix at the top, everything's fine. But as soon as I get it a little bit deeper, and then it gets really tough, and the whole bucket starts to spin, and the drill stops. Yeah, I think it's because the drill's trying to mix it too fast. When we're mixing it by hand, it's slow, and you can still let it stay a liquid, but now you're just making a solid. Right, because it's a sheer thickening fluid, exactly. so if you hit it really quickly with something, like the blades of this spinning really quickly in the thing, it'll suddenly turn into a solid, and it'll be really hard to mix. Yep. So we go slow. Going slow. Going slow. Suddenly realizing that if we go slow, we'll be here forever. Yep. You know what I think we need? Whoa. Whoa, sorry. You know what I think we need? We need a different way to mix this. Yep. We need a way to mix more of it, and we need a way that it doesn't hit it with blades that suddenly go through it really quickly. Something that can mix on a large scale, but slowly. I have just the thing. Come with me. All right. The interesting thing about bubbles is they're a gas surrounded by a liquid. So get some dish soap and some water, and then be science maximites and find things around the house that you can make bubbles out of. Just about anything that has holes will do. Or, mm -hmm. or 
I like this one. I call it the loud bubble. the Ontario Science Centre, and this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Good. So you are amazing at bubbles. Uh, I am. I've been practicing for a while. Let's get started. Okay. You're going to make an okie dokie sign like this. Uh -huh. You're going to dip it right into our bubble solution. Make, come on, get right in okay, there, right, right in, in there. Make sure you get it all. Oh, that's, that's a little too much. Well, that's then good. I can make two. And then you're going to keep that okie dokie sign. You're going to blow very gently. Nice. I brought these two giant sticks here, and I don't know if you noticed, but I've got a smoke machine here. Right. So we'll turn that on, and then if you press that green button there, you're gonna shoot some smoke, and we're gonna try to catch that smoke in a giant bubble. You ready? Okay, and I'm gonna try to... Oh, that was so that was close. Great. Did you see wow. that one? You give it a shot. Nice! Oh, check yeah. that out! That was amazing! <laughs> that was huge. Try it again. Let's see if I can get the smoke so machine. Here we go. Go for it, go for it. Push right towards... Oh, check that out, you did it, look at that, look at that! No! Smoke, and it, yeah. bounces, it bounces on the floor because the floor, it doesn't have any oils like our hands do. Isn't that amazing? That was oh great. my god, that was so cool. That was great. You know what I think we should do? What's that? Giant bubble, tons of smoke. Done. Okay, here we go. Let's do it, you ready? Giant bubble, tons of smoke, go. Awesome! Oh my god! <laughs> Look at that! Woo! Amazing! Look at that! That's crazy! Max out bubble! Well, there you go! Giant smoke filled bubbles! Awesome! Yeah! Judy and I tried mixing the cornstarch mud using a drill with a mixer attachment, but it didn't work. We should have known better. Here's the mixer in our cornstarch mud. Usually, a mixer works by going really fast and mixing everything together. But remember that cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid. So, when the blades of the mixer tried to go fast through the cornstarch mud, it did what it always does, turn solid. The faster and harder you try to move it, the more solid it will become. This means the only way to mix it would be if we made the drill go very, very slow which wouldn't speed things up at all. So with the drill another lost cause, Judy and I okay. need the biggest thing around that could mix stuff up. Come on back. Good. Little bit more. Perfect. <laughs> a cement truck, a cement truck is a perfect thing to mix because all we have to do is get all the cornstarch up in here and it'll mix it and it doesn't move it too fast. It goes nice and slow. So hopefully a sheer thickening fluid will be fine. I'm gonna get Judy. She's driving the truck. Hey Judy, that's perfect. The only problem is we needed to get all of those bags of cornstarch into the hopper of the cement truck. I didn't think it'd be this messy. <sighs> We needed to call the entire Science Max build team to help us out. This is possibly the messiest thing I've ever done. Awesome! Woo. Hey Judy, you wanna you wanna lift up any bags? I'm okay, thanks. That's okay. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, so uh, I can do them. Cool. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Yeah! <laughs> I got most of it. I got most of it. All right, I think we're done. I think that's enough bags. Let's start the mixing! So, what do you think, Judy? Do you think it's gonna work? I think so, because you're mixing at a very large volume, but at a very low speed. Yep. So throughout the process, it'll stay a liquid until we're ready to run across it. That sounds exactly like the kind of science I like to see. You know what I really like is that every time I move, more cornstarch comes off. It's like, it's like I'm a human fog machine. This 
else is liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up most of the air we breathe, but if you get it really, really cold, it turns into a liquid. The fun thing is you can use it to make other things really, really cold too, like this banana. I have frozen this banana solid thanks to the liquid nitrogen, and normally a mushy banana would not be able to hammer in a nail, but, whoa, because it's frozen, I can hammer this nail into this block of wood. So that got me wondering, if I can turn a banana into a hammer using liquid nitrogen, could I turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer? Let's find out. Pumpkin sledgehammer, take one. No, I, I think the answer is no, you cannot turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer with liquid nitrogen. All you can do is make a really, really big mess. I'm gonna have to clean this up, aren't I? Now we have a cement truck to help us do the mixing for our cornstarch mud. After making a giant mess getting the cornstarch into the cement truck, it's time to see if it worked. Hey, Phil, how's it going? Yeah, it looks like it's mixing pretty well. I'm really glad we are not doing this by hand, because it'd take a... It'd take a really long time. We've almost got it at the right consistency, but it's taken some time. But it's getting a little dark out, Judy. I don't know, do you, do you want to quit and go home? No. Of course not. That's not what we do in science. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's see it. Let's see if it's... I like how it comes down in little steps. And look, it's still, it's working just like it should. I hit it. And it's solid, but you can see it's pouring like a liquid. Yeah, here comes a big wave. Wow. Here it comes. Whoa! <laughs> and it's totally filling up. Oh yeah, filling up really fast. I think we should stop pouring very soon. Yep, we may not have a big enough trough. Yep. Hey, liking it. It's good. Yeah, I think it's time. It's not even done pouring, but I'm gonna try it. Okay, you ready? Whoa. Oh, <laughs> oh and you did it! Whoa, you can't. You have to get back onto the sides before you stop moving. Or else it becomes a liquid. All right, it's your turn. Okay. Here. Go. Okay, ready? Okay. You gotta, you gotta hit your feet really fast. All right. Here you go. Yeah! Oh God, this actually works. Because cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid, it means it stays a liquid until you hit it suddenly, like with your hands, or in this case, our feet. And then it turns to a solid. So as long as Judy and I keep slapping our feet down with enough force, we can walk on top of it. One more dance. All right. And let's tell you do what, it. we'll do one more dance. All right, let's do that. Okay, ready? All right. And, and go. All right. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We've done it. Solids, liquid, gases. Thanks very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large. Woo! Greetings, Science... Yeah, that's much better. Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be talking about sound. Sound is all around us. We use it every day, but what is it, really? Sound is energy. Let's say that this is the... That this... No, stay. Stay. Okay that this spring is the sound of my voice. When I make noise, it travels away from me in a wave. One air molecule vibrates the next, the air molecule vibrates the next, and it looks like a wave. And when there's a little bit of energy, the wave doesn't move very much. Science! But when there's a lot of energy, the wave moves a lot. Science! What do we do? What do, what do we do? to make sound louder. This is the Science Max theme song. But it's not very loud, because the speaker on my phone isn't designed to make super loud noises. 
So what we're going to do is find ways to make the volume of that song as loud as possible. Here is one way. Take a phone playing some music and put it in a glass. Make sure the glass is empty, of course. Huh? And suddenly, it's a lot louder. Wow! Why this works is one of the things we're gonna be looking at today. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna learn how to make sound louder, as loud as we can. But I'm gonna need an expert to help me. Um, oh, I know, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. She's very smart. All I need to do is go to the Ontario Science Center and see if she's busy. Uh, yeah, Michaela, it's good to see you. Nice to um, see you too. That was weird. Yeah. I was wondering if you could give me a hand with an experiment. Oh, I'd love to, yeah. It's a sound experiment. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Right on. <laughs> okay, we'll take the portal. We'll go back to Science Max headquarters. Oh, take the portal? Cool. Haven't you taken the portal before? No, don't you remember? It wasn't working last time. Oh, well, it's. Is it working? Fixed this time. Yeah, no, it'll be great. <laughs> Trust me. Here we go. Okay. Usually when I come through the portal, I land on something or something falls on me or... Not today. It's your lucky day. I guess so. Safe landing. Safe nice. landing. High five. All right. So let's get started. Okay, cool. This is the experiment I want to max out today, Michaela. I know. Pretty impressive, right? No, no, hold on. <laughs> okay. So I take my phone and I play some music on my phone and... It's loud, Yay, right? Check it out. Now you've just made yourself a resonance chamber. A resonance chamber. A Very resonance nice. chamber is what we say when we're trying to describe how the sound is amplified. So if the sound's coming in from one direction, it's bouncing around, not really losing energy. Mm -hmm. So when more sound comes in, that's amplified. We hear it a lot louder. That's cool. So that's what I want to do. Hold on, let me turn this off. That's what I want to do today. I want to max out as much sound as we can get out of the Science Max theme song, oh, which I'm is so totally awesome. So, what else can we do to do that? Uh, well, there's a couple avenues I'm thinking. Do you want to try something with electricity or without electricity? That's, because with electricity, we're talking speaker systems and, and yeah. right. So we why don't we do it. no electricity for now, and then right. we can jump to electricity when we feel we've, we've exhausted everything that's non-electric. Cool. So I was thinking we could try to make a megaphone because uh, if we have a lot of sound, we could, you know, funnel it in one direction and then it'll be louder. Okay. What yeah. So the megaphone's pretty easy to make, right? We could just use, in fact, we could use this piece of paper, right? Yeah. Let's try it. What do you think? Uh, I think it's very mega megaphony. Science taping it up. Okay. Ready? <laughs> okay. Turn it on. Play it. And doesn't sound. But what if I do this? Oh, that song. Yeah. <laughs> you hear it? <laughs> oh, I hear it. Okay. <laughs> so that worked pretty well. So oh, yeah, it works. It works well. So, okay, so this is pretty easy, right? Yeah. Megaphone? Oh yeah. So why don't we max this out? Why don't we make a giant megaphone and see if it makes a big difference? I think it will. Let's do it. Sounds good. Let's get started. <laughs> Is vibration, but it's really hard. To... It's really hard to learn about that vibration if you can't see it. I mean, sound is invisible, right? Well, here's a way that you can make sound visible. All you need is some plastic wrap and salt and a bowl, just a regular bowl, and an elastic like this. So what you do is you take the plastic wrap and cut off a piece just large enough to fit over the bowl, and then use the elastic to wrap around the bowl to keep the plastic tight. Pour some salt on the bowl, and then watch this. Hello, vibrating salt. The plastic wrap is stretched tight over the bowl, making it like a drum, a drum that's very sensitive to sound vibrations. Your ear works the same way. That's why we call it an ear drum. The vibrations from my voice make the plastic wrap vibrate, and that makes the salt dance. But there's more. Let's max this out. 
This is a cladney plate. And what it is, is just a piece of metal on a platform that vibrates up and down to a frequency which I can program with this dial here. And when the sound waves vibrate the plate, they can interact in ways that make the sand form interesting patterns. Take a look. The sounds I'm generating vibrate the plate, make it move like a wave. But when the vibrations reach the edge of the plate, they bounce back and interact with the other waves going the other way. The way these waves interact at different notes is what causes the sand to make these different shapes. So this is great, but you know what? We can max it out even more. Maxing it out even more. Okay, that's about as much as I can take of that. Whoa. So Michaela and I are on a quest to make the loudest sound we can. The first step is to make things louder without using electricity. We've looked at a resonance chamber, and now we're going to make a large megaphone. Sounds can be amplified by bouncing sound waves around in a space. When I put my phone into the glass, the glass acts as a resonance chamber. The sound waves bounce around inside the glass, and they combine and stack on top of each other. This makes the sound louder. Residence chambers are used by musical instruments, like an acoustic guitar. The wooden chamber bounces the sound waves around, and the sound waves build on each other to make the sound louder. A megaphone bounces sound waves as well. Instead of going off in all directions, a megaphone makes the sound waves all go in one direction. That's one of the reasons why a megaphone makes sounds louder, but only when it's pointed at you. So will a bigger megaphone work better? So we've made a larger megaphone, which is exactly the same thing. You just take a sheet and you roll it up, except our sheet was plexiglass covered in paper, and we've taped it together so it stays. And the idea here... Oh, yeah, bigger megaphone. We're going to vibrate even more of the air inside of here, and hopefully this thing will be louder. OK, so you're ready to try it with the phone? Yeah. I think first we should try it with our voices, though. OK. <laughs> Awesome, I can totally hear you, that's Either amazing. Way. And it would be fall. No, no summer, mm, spring, Think it's about it. anything but winter. So the maxed out megaphone worked, but we still had to try it with my phone. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. How about now? No, not so much, not so much. Oh yeah. No, no. So oh. that is a that great cool. example of non-electrical amplification. That's right. Amplify the sounds, no electricity. OK, bye-bye. <laughs> Come on, make some noise! Well, to know that, you gotta know your sound. All sound is vibration. Here, take a closer look. You see? You got. It. Okay, let's try this again. All sound is vibration. The string of this guitar vibrates, which vibrates the air around it, causing the sound that you hear. Your vocal cords vibrate in your throat, causing you to make a sound. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. See how it's shaking back and forth? It's vibrating. Things that make a high sound they vibrate faster. Vibrating really fast. <laughs> Things that make a low sound vibrate slowly. <laughs> High note, vibrating fast. Fast! Everything 
has a resonance, a note that it vibrates best at. Let's say this fish tank is, well, any container where sound would be vibrating, and the waves of water are actually waves of sound. Now, normally, sound waves will bounce around inside the container, off the walls, and go back and forth like that. And how fast I move this piece of wood is the frequency or the note that we're playing. I could vibrate this wood very fast and make a high note. I could move this plank very slow and make a low note. And the waves just bounce around inside the container. But there's a speed I can move this plank where the waves stop going side to side and suddenly get twice as big. The waves bouncing off the sides of the tank are meeting the waves going in the other direction. But what we end up seeing is peaks of the waves not moving side to side, just going up and down, like you see here. This is the resonant frequency of this container. So, let's max this out. Say I have a wine glass, and I wet my finger, and I rub it around the rim. It vibrates at a certain note. That note is the resonant frequency of this wine glass. So what would happen if we were to play that note back to this wine glass really, really loud? And yes, this is something you should not try at home. This note makes the glass vibrate the most. Finding the perfect note things vibrate best at is great for musical instruments, but it's not great for this wine glass. The sound waves are causing the glass to vibrate a lot. And because this glass is delicate, it can only vibrate so much before it breaks. The vibrations were so strong that the glass literally shook itself to pieces. <laughs> Science! Sorry. Science! Oh, wait. Science! Michaela and I have tried a resonance chamber and a giant megaphone to make sound louder. Now it's time to move on to the next step of the plan, using electricity to help us amplify sound. And that means speakers. So speakers that you have at home, three different speakers here, right? Looks three really different busy. cones. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So here. what's the deal? Well, here at the bottom, uh, we have a subwoofer. A sub, wait a minute, a subwoofer. Subwoofer. So it's a, a woofer, the word is woofer. Yep. And it's, okay, so it's for dogs. <laughs> right? No, no, a subwoofer is for low notes here in our speaker. Ah. At the top here, we have a tweeter. So it's for birds. It's a, birds, dogs. <laughs> so low, let me guess, low notes? Yeah. It's tweeters, high notes? Yeah, yeah, high notes. And then we have this guy here in the middle, and that's called your mid-range speaker. Oh, that's not nearly a cool name. <laughs> now we have speakers, we've taken a look at that, but why don't we take one apart, cool. right? Yeah, let's do it. I've got this one here that I spilled juice on, <laughs> um, so it doesn't work anymore, so I've kind of taken yeah. it apart. So cool. it's oh, got, man, that's awesome. okay, so it's got the cover, that's cool. So what I find interesting is there's there's the speaker and the wires, right? Because it's electrical amplification. But check this out. This is just a ring to hold that on. And the rest is just an empty box. We know what that is. Resonance, Resonance chamber. chamber. That's right. So that's why it's an empty box. So Let's take this apart too, see what's going on. So that's just, that's the paper cone. Yeah. Right, so that's the like that's the drum, I guess. It's like the eardrum, the thing that vibrates. Yes, yeah. yeah. This cool thing vibrates. So that yeah. this whole that's thing. That's our electromagnet. When we turn this on, the electromagnet goes on and off, and uh, it's causing this whole thing to vibrate. So that's how it works. It's the electricity top turning the electromagnet on and off. Exactly. And it's on and off, on and off, and on and off, and on and off, <laughs> and then <laughs> it makes it makes it vibrate at certain speeds. Right? Yeah. Hertz. The number yeah. of times it vibrates per second is hertz. What we could do is we could max it out with the speaker and plug the phone into the speaker. Mm -hmm. But this step does not feel like science max to me because anybody oh, can do that, right? Yeah. You can just turn up your television right now and that's pretty much the same kind of thing. We yeah. need electrical amplification but maxed max out. Max it out. What are you thinking? Okay, so <laughs> I, I, I've got a friend yeah. and he's got a stereo system that he built, he put together. And what he does is he tours different cities. So he said he'd bring it by what? Science Max headquarters. He's gonna bring it here? We gotta go outside. We can see this thing. And it's very loud, so we have to go outside. When's he coming? Um, 
right now. Awesome. All right, let's go check it out. Seeing sound vibrations is fun. This kind of speaker is a special kind. It's called a subwoofer, which is designed to give you the low notes, the big rumbly bass sounds. I tilt the speaker so it's facing up and cover it with big sheets of plastic wrap, which I push into the cone. Then tape it so it's nice and secure. Then what you need is some cornstarch mud, which is two parts cornstarch, one part water. I've got some yellow cornstarch and some blue cornstarch. This experiment works the best with low notes. I'm playing a tone through the stereo that is very low. Here's what happens when I turn up the volume. fluid, which means when you impact it, it turns solid. So the vibrations from the speaker cone are making the cornstarch mud impact, and that's turning it into a solid. But then it sort of also melts back into a liquid, so you get little columns of cornstarch coming up and falling down again. It's like it's dancing. Whoa! Visual sound waves. Science! Science! So Michaela and I are going to max out sound. To do that, we need a maxed out sound system. This is gonna be amazing. This so is gonna cool. be super maxed out sound experiment. This I'm is so James, fun. Michaela. Hey, James, James. Nice how are you? you? Thanks for coming, buddy. Nice to meet you. So, tell us about your speaker system. It looks a lot like a vehicle. <laughs> This is my audio van. It's got four 15-inch subwoofers in the back. It's got a whole bunch of power to power it, and I'm glad to be here to let you guys hear it today. Wow. Awesome. So if I have a speaker at home, the, like a little speaker like this, how many watts do you think that would be? Somewhere between 15 and 25. 15 and 25 watts, yes. And you've got 4,000. Yes. So that's a lot more. Yeah, quite a bit. And subwoofers, they play low notes. Yes. So is that better when you have a van like this? With a car audio van like this, you want to play low notes, like your house stereos, and that will play anything from 120 to 200 hertz. I'm playing 20 hertz to about 35 max for you guys today. So that's like a yeah. sort of rumble of thunder. Yes, very kind low. Of blah, 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 yeah. Where you really feel it. Yes. Like a train going past almost. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So we get our hearing protection on and we try it out. I know what you're thinking. Phil, what's the point of having loud music if you can't really hear it? Because we've gone from listening to music to feeling it. <laughs> the sound waves are so strong that they have become a physical presence. Michaela's hair flies around because the air from the speakers is creating shock waves. The sound waves are so powerful, they move the air back and forth, which makes Michaela's hair dance all over the place. And my hair, not so much. <laughs> I'm totally jealous of your long hair. Yeah, you need to get longer hair. Okay, hold on, I'll go right Okay. Here. Whoa! <laughs> Science back, experiments at large, super, super sound. sound! High fives. Yes. Okay, ready to go again? So cool, yeah, let's do it. Okay, here we go. 